Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for the first PHRN webinar for 2021. Um, this year we're very excited to be highlighting research groups and researchers who have been um, working with linked data for a long time now. Australia has a long history of using linked data and there are quite a number of researchers and research groups around the country who have been making major contributions to science through their use of linked data. So this year our series is going to be called the Linkage Luminary Series and today uh, given that on Monday it was the International Women's Day we're very excited to welcome the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health uh, to present today and I'm going to introduce to you Professor Geeta Mishra who is the director of the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health and she's going to introduce um, the study and various members of her team who are going to talk about a range of research using linked data that they've been doing um, and some of the results which we'll all be very interested to hear from. So I'm going to hand over to Geeta. Thank you very much. We very excited to hear from you. Thank you, Felicity. Fel yeah, are we good? We're good. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I'll, give, I'll start with a brief introduction to the study while my colleagues will demonstrate the data linkage process and how we've used linked data in research. Okay, this year we are celebrating the 25th anniversary when the baseline surveys were launched. The study has been funded by the Australian Government Department of Health since 1995. The main purpose is to provide evidence base for the development and evaluation of policy and practice in the areas of service delivery affecting women. It also aims to provide an accurate picture of health and well-being of women in Australia and also to examine factors that determine good health and also those which cause ill health through adult life. The study is jointly conducted by the University of Queensland and the University of Newcastle. Now, this is one of the largest and longest running study of its kind in Australia. In 1996, three aged cohorts were recruited. Those born in 1973 to 78. They were aged 18 to 23 in 1996. Now they are in their mid 40s. Then you have the cohort that were born in 1946 to 51. They were aged 45 to 50 and now they are in their early 70s. And then you have the 1921-26 cohort. They, are, they were 70 to 75 years and now they are in their late 90s. So at the inception of the study, these cohorts were described as young, young adults, mids and older cohorts. These age groups were chosen as they represented the beginning of an important life stage. So for the youngs, you know, they, these were the time they finished their education and they're moving into employment, family formation, etc. For the mids, they're moving into the end of her reproductive life you know, and menopause and so forth. And for the older, we wanted to know what happens to life post-retirement. The sampling frame for the, was the Medicare Australia database. At that time, it was known as the Health Insurance Commission database. Women from rural and remote areas were oversampled. Now, in 2020, 12 to 2013, which is 17 years since the original study. So you can imagine the so-called young adults were no longer young. 
and information on the health and well-being of current young women were lacking. So we were funded to recruit a new cohort of women age 18 to 23, they're known as the 1989-95 cohort. This time, recruitment was done entirely through social media. The map shows the distribution of residents uh, of all the participants. These cohorts were broadly representative of the population at the time of recruitment. In 2016-17, NHMRC funded us the Mothers and Their Children study, and this is to study the health and well-being of children born to mothers in the 1973-78 cohort. This um, table here shows um, the study this provides the number of um, samples that we had at baseline, but also the number numbers of waves. Survey nine for the 73-78 cohort, uh, when women will be aged 43 to 48 years, will go out in this April or May. Currently, we are analyzing the pilot data. Now, to maintain the representativeness of the study, we will refresh the two youngest cohort with women from South Asia and from Southeast Asian background. Apart from collecting quantitative data through the survey questions, we also have collected qualitative data. On the last page of each survey, women were given opportunity to inform us of anything we've missed. So far, more than 30,000 women have provided with us with qualitative data. More recently, in collaboration with Luke Nips and his teams, the ALSH data sets have been enriched with the inclusion of environmental data, namely with green space and air pollution metrics. I'll now hand you over to my colleague, Colin, who is gonna describe the data linkage program. Thank you, Geeta. Um, this is an overview of our current link data holdings. We obtain national data from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. The AHW data linkage unit holds a concordance file between the ALSH participant numbers and the Medicare pins. Hence, national linkages for our main cohorts are mostly deterministic and are generally updated annually. Being a national study, we link with national collections wherever possible, for example, the Australian Cancer Database. And we expect to increase the scope of national linkages as um, new collections which are being developed by the AHW become available. State collections are linked probabilistically by the relevant data linkage units. Uh, so for each new linkage round, we send through the participant address, including all their um, known changes of name and address and um, processing times for the state linkages tend to be a bit longer. So we aim to refresh those collections every two years. Oops, sorry. Um, the, oh, um, applications for health data from South Australia, um, the Northern Territory, uh, Tasmania and Victoria are, are processed through the um, PHRN online application system. Uh, but there are other applications predate that, um, si that system. And um, records for children in the Mothers and Their Children's Health sub-study are linked to state and national education collections with maternal consent. Um, and this involves a whole other set of pr processes and data custodians. So we've only completed one linkage round for those so far. Um, the study has an internal data access committee to manage data use by both internal researchers and external collaborators. We have a light option where confidentialised uh, basic survey data can be accessed relatively quickly from the Australian Data Archive. But for full data, data sets, um, plus or minus link, link data, they are only available direct, by direct application to ALSH. And we have a new portal for managing applications, researchers and publications for each project. The application process is described on our website. There is information about the various data sets as well as a list of um, other projects that have been approved. 
Um, each project must nominate an internal ELSH project liaison and after discussing the proposal, the liaison agrees to provide advice and oversight to the project. And once the application or expression of interest has been worked up, it's lodged in the online portal, then, um, um, sorry, <laughs> and then once it's approved, the data use agreements are completed, including the um, ALSH agreement, other data custodians agreements, as well as amendments to add new researchers um, to the protocols. Um, so this is all, all that is managed by the ELSH team and requires extra processing time. So that's on top of the uh, approximately two months um, turnaround time for requests for survey data only. Linked data sets can only be used on site at ELSH or via the shores at user's expense, while survey only data sets can be securely transferred to the researcher's institution. Projects are initially approved for two years and report annually on pro and we also keep uh, collaborators informed through regular newsletters. Um, just touching on a few of the process issues, um, ALSHA's data linkage consent mechanisms have changed over time in line with the legal and ethical guidelines. Less than 5% of all participants have declined data linkage and they're excluded from linked data requests. So we have a 96% coverage of our sample, which is really important for the representativeness of findings and also to determine the correct sequence of health events over time. Um, as a longitudinal study with data being continually updated from multiple sources, we perform our own data integration. To maintain the identification, we separate the data with the participant database held at the University of Newcastle, while the research data sets, including linked data, are held at the University of Queensland under a different set of identifiers. Um, naturally, the data linkage units also have a different um, linkage key for their processes. Um, the ALSH data manager at the University of Queensland prepares the project data sets. If they contain linked data, the ID alias is replaced by a one-time project ID. And that means that if a researcher is working across several pro projects, they can't uh, link the data sets. And we also mask and code sensible, sensitive variables in the data sets. One of the challenges for a data analysis is to harmonize variables between collections and over time. Uh, the scope and context of each collection must be considered. Um, does it include both public and private hospitals? Have there been policy changes which may impact the collection? Uh, as well as available variables and date ranges. Linkage methods such as the sensitivity of probabilistic matching may also vary. And it's generally up to each project team to harmonize the data depending on their research question. Um, however, identifying particular medical conditions is a frequent aim in our research. So we have developed some chronic conditions data sets which use all collections, both surveys and linked data, to ascertain the onset of common conditions such as dementia, heart disease, diabetes and cancer. These data sets containing only key variables will be made available soon and will streamline and streamline and standardize the analysis phase for many of our projects, but the access procedures remain the same as for the source data. Um, and just to note that this is our, our running this program is quite a resource intensive activity and we have two dedicated uh, positions just to um, look after all the applications and approvals. So uh, now for the exciting part, which will illustrate the use of our rich data resources and our next three speakers will cover recent publications which use different cohorts and different data sources. Um, Katrina. Hello. <laughs> um, so in this paper we investigated the association between maternal depression and children's behaviour and development and we wanted to explore whether there are periods of development that are more sensitive to harmful exposures than others. And we focused on preconception, pregnancy and early childhood. And this question is more than academic, even though I think it's pretty interesting, but it has implications for where we focus our resources. So for example, if pregnancy is a sensitive period, then we need to direct our resources towards pregnant women. 
but if all of those periods of development are equally influential, sorry, back a screen, Colleen, oh, I'll let you know. <laughs> um, I was running behind. <laughs> yeah. Um, if though all of the periods of development are as influential, what we need to do then is focus on detecting and treating maternal depression at any point across the early life course. So to answer this question, we use statistical life course modeling to test critical period, sensitive period and accumulation hypotheses. Thanks, Colleen. So if we just focus on pregnancy as an example, if pregnancy is a critical period, you'd see an association for maternal depression during pregnancy, but not at any other time. If pregnancy is a sensitive period, you'd see an association for maternal depression at all of the other stages, but the association in pregnancy would be the strongest. And if the effects of maternal depression snowball, you'd see the more exposure, the worse the outcomes for children. So we used data from the cohort born in 1973 to 78 that were part of our Mothers and Their Children's Health study. For this particular piece of research, we could only include women who had completed a survey while they were pregnant, and that gave us 978 children. They were aged 2 to 12 years, Colleen, thank you, um, and 49% were girls. Almost 7% of those had behaviour problems on the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which was completed by mums. For a smaller sample of 441 children, we were able to obtain linked data from the Australian Early Development Census, or AEDC. That's rated by teachers in the first year of primary school, but it's only done every three years, which is why our sample for this part of the question was smaller. So of these, 16% were rated vulnerable or at risk on social competence and emotional maturity. Mothers were classified as having symptoms of depression if they scored 10 or more on the 10 item version of the Centre for Epidemiological Studies depression scale. 69% of mothers didn't report symptoms at any point. For the remaining mothers, about 17% reported symptoms preconception and in early childhood, and slightly less reported symptoms during pregnancy. And if you're doing the maths, the percentages don't add to 100 because some mothers reported symptoms at more than one time point. So this diagram shows the regression coefficients for the timing of maternal depression and child development. The part that you can see that's not blocked out is the saturated model, and that contains every combination of timing. So in life course modeling, you compare your other models to this one to see which one fits best. The critical period models did not fit well. And same for the sensitive period models. And you can see on the diagram that the regression coefficients for the three different time periods are pretty similar. Thanks, Colleen. So the accumulation model was the best fit for the data. And you can see that behavior problems increased with each extra period of exposure to maternal depression. So as a sensitivity analysis, we repeated the modeling with the AEDC data. We found the same pattern of results, even though it's reversed, because on the SDQ, high scores are worse, whereas on the AEDC, low scores are worse. We still got poor fit for the critical and sensitive period models. And best fit for the accumulation model with development worsening with each period of exposure to maternal depression, although the relationship is a bit less linear here. So in our study, pregnancy was not a sensitive period and actually there were no sensitive or critical periods. Depression at any time was bad and depression at more times was worse. Having access to the linked AEDC data meant that we could confirm the pattern of results using an outcome variable that wasn't rated by mothers. And this helped us to overcome an important limitation and strengthened our confidence in the findings. And it also shows that maternal depression is associated with a whole range of outcomes for children and reiterates why it's really important that we can try and target our resources to doing something about this. Okay. 
I think, is it Louise next, Colleen? That's right. Over to Louise. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Katrina. Um, so, hello. Today I'm going to talk about a study that looked at vitamin D testing. So, in the early 2000s, vitamin D testing in Australia increased dramatically, particularly in women. Concerns about the cost of potentially unnecessary testing led to a review of the MBS vitamin D testing item. And in response to this review, the Australian government introduced new criteria in, in 2014 to limit testing to only those who are at high risk of vitamin D deficiency. So the aims of our study were to assess whether the new criteria change testing rates in Australian women and also to look at the socioeconomic, geographic, health and health service use characteristics of women who were still undergoing tests. The results of the study were published in Archives of Osteoporosis in October last year. So in the first instance, we described national vitamin D testing trends in Australian women aged 15 years and over, both before and after the introduction of the new testing criteria. And for this analysis, we used publicly available aggregate MBS data. We then used survey and linked MBS data for 7,800 women from the 1946 to 51 cohort of the Australian Longitudinal Study on Women's Health to examine who was more likely to have vitamin D tests under the new criteria. Information from the surveys was all collected by self-report. The linked MBS data gave us information on vitamin D tests, as well as general practitioner visits and bone density tests. So this slide shows the timeframes for the analysis. The new MBS vitamin D testing criteria were introduced in November 2014, and that's the vertical purple line on the graph. Our outcome of interest was whether a woman, woman ever had a vitamin D test between November 2014 and June 2019, which was the latest available linked MBS data that we had available at the time of the analysis. The survey data on socioeconomic and health behaviour variables were collected from women at Survey 7 in 2013, when the women were, were between 62 and 67 years of age. Three additional health service use variables were derived using linked MBS data. Firstly, whether a woman had a vitamin D test in the two years prior to the introduction of the new testing criteria, and also the average number of annual GP visits a woman had between November 2014 and June 2019, and whether she had a bone density test during this period as well. So this is the rate of vitamin D tests in the 1946 to 51 cohort between 1996 and 2019. This testing rate pattern is actually very similar to that seen in women of all age groups in the general population in our analysis using aggregate MBS data. You can see that there was a steady and sustained increase in testing rates up to 2013. The testing rates then declined for a short period before increasing again from 2016 onwards. So some of you have probably noticed that the testing rates started to decline before the introduction of the new testing criteria. And this was likely due to the impact of education activities by organisations such as MBS Medicine Wise in the lead up period to the new testing items being used by general practitioners. So just over half of the women in the 1946 to 1951 cohort had a vitamin D test between November 2014 and June 2019. So this forest plot shows which women were more likely to get a vitamin D test after the introduction of the new MBS test criteria. We found that women who had a bone density test and those living at lower latitudes with less sun exposure were more likely to have a vitamin D test. But other factors associated with having a vitamin D test under the new criteria were having had a vitamin D test prior to the introduction of the new criteria and also visiting a GP more than twice a year. And you can see from the forest plot that the strongest associations were in women who visited their GP more than eight times a year. Women were less likely to have a vitamin D test if they were current smokers, lived outside a major city or had less than a high school education. So to conclude, although testing initially declined, the introduction of new criteria has not led to, led to sustained declines in testing. Testing of women living at lower latitudes and those who had bone density tests suggests that some targeted testing is occurring in women at, higher vitamin, at risk of higher vitamin D deficiency. However, 
The high testing rates and repeated testing also seem to indicate that there are women who are either being routinely tested as part of a suite of general blood tests, or perhaps a smaller proportion may be being monitored after starting vitamin D supplements. So this study does seem to indicate though, that there is at least some level of over-testing for vitamin D deficiency in Australian women that's still occurring, pointing to the need for perhaps additional education strategies or other interventions to reduce over-testing. So thank you, and I'll now hand over to Annette. Thanks. I'm going to talk about some work we did on older women's use of health services in the last two years of life and the extent to which this is affected if they have dementia. It's actually quite difficult to identify all people in the general population who have dementia including Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. They may be living in the community with minimal contact with specialist diagnostic services. Dementia may not be recorded in hospital records or even on death certificates. For these reasons, we used multiple data sources to identify women in the study who had at least one record of dementia. This may be from a proxy response to a survey with a comment that the woman couldn't respond due to dementia or a hospital record, or prescription for Alzheimer's specific medication, an age care assessment, or possibly only on the death certificate. We also use the same method to identify women with other common cr chronic conditions, as Colleen mentioned earlier. For women born in 1921 to 26, they over the period of the study, they ranged in age from 70 to over 90. At these ages, multiple morbidity is common. It affects the use of health services. And the pattern of comorbid conditions may also differ between women with dementia and women without dementia, as shown on this slide. For example, heart disease and stroke were more common in women who had dementia than in women who didn't have dementia. In contrast, COPD was about equally common. For this reason, we had to be careful in designing our analysis of the effects of dementia on the use of health services. We used match groups of women in order to compare women of exactly the same age, because age is one of the main determinants of multimorbidity and of dementia. They were matched on calendar time, defined by the date of death of one of the pair. This is because the availability of services has changed over time. We also matched them on jurisdiction because, for example, hospital data are available at different times for different states. And we matched on rurality as this affects uh, the use, access to health services. So in this example, we had four groups of women. All the women had heart disease. There were groups with or without dementia, and there were women who died and matched women who didn't die for at least another two years. This slide shows the percentage of women in residential aged care. The top black line is for women with heart disease and dementia and who died. The left end of the graph is 24 months before they died at that stage, more than 40% were in residential aged care. This increased almost 80% in the month before they died, shown at the right end of the graph. Similarly, the blue line shows the rising percentage of women with heart disease and dementia who didn't die for at least another two years. The corresponding percentages of for women with heart disease but not dementia are shown in the yellow and green lines. Far, far fewer of them were in residential aged care. Being in residential aged care influences the use of other services. For example, it meant that women were not using community-based services, including respite, um, home maintenance, help, and so on. Here's a similar graph for hospitalization. 
The yellow line shows hospitalization rising rapidly in the months just before death for women with heart disease, but not dementia. The black line shows, also shows a rise in hospitalization shortly before death for women with heart disease and dementia, but their rate of hospitalization was notably lower than that for women without dementia. And for the women who didn't die, that's the blue and green lines, hospitalization was relatively uncommon. The findings for specialist visits showed the same pattern, higher for women without dementia. In contrast, this graph shows the data for GP visits. Here, the patterns for women with and without dementia were almost the same, both rising in the months before death. So in summary, we use linked data to identify women with selected chronic conditions and also to, to analyze their use of health services. Women with dementia were more likely to be in residential aged care, less likely to be hospitalized or see specialists or use community-based services, but just as likely to see GPs. This pattern was the same for women with other chronic conditions than heart disease, as, as in this example. This work shows, the import, shows it's important to understand the connections between the aged care and health service sectors when you consider the patterns of usage. I'll now hand back to Geeta. Thank you, Annette. Okay, so, um, so the ARSH data, it is a national resource. And so the data sets are freely available. Um, and you've heard Colin mentioning about the process involved in applying to use the data. So, so far we've had um, around over 160 researchers that are using or have used the linked health record data uh, with almost 200 projects being approved. The linked data has also been used um, by more than 20 PhD students uh, and there have been almost 100 papers, scientific papers and reports published. And this number is rapidly increasing along with the, because of the longer follow-up of cohorts. Uh, there's also been an increase in the expertise in analyzing these sorts of data within the group. So we definitely welcome collaborations. Uh, you'll see that we've um, updated our website there you can find all the information you need about the linked uh, administrative data sets, uh, how to access them, but also uh, if you want to look at all the series of papers that we've uh, published and reports that have used linked data, you can um, do a quick search on, on the website. So in conclusion, really we uh, particularly want to thank uh, the PHRN not only for assisting us to get access to this wonderful uh, record data, but also for the kind in invitation to showcase our work. So thank you very much. And I also thank all uh, my team members for presenting today. So if you have any questions, we'll be happy to take them. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Geeta. Um, that was a marvellous overview of a wonderful longitudinal cohort and hopefully everybody has learnt a lot about what you can achieve with longitudinal cohorts and the ability to link them to administrative data. As Gita said, we're very happy to take questions now. So if you have any questions, you can enter them into the Q&A box on your screen and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, we've already got a few in, so let's get started. So the first question was, um, how often is the aged, I presume that's the age group data refreshed? Um, so it depends what are you talking about? Is it the survey data? So survey data, we refresh it, I mean, we collect um, data every three years approximately for the different age uh, groups. So it is longitudinal and every three years we get 
more information about their health and well-being. Now, are you talking about the linked data? Maybe six months for the older ones. Yes, that's correct, Annette. So for the 19, basically for the 1973-78 cohort and the 1946-51 cohort, we collect them every three years. Um, the 1921-26 um, cohort, uh, we've been collecting them for every six months for the last, I would say, good 16 or 17 surveys because, you know, of, of the declining health and well-being. For the 1989-95 for the cohort, we have been collecting them every year, but uh, we will start to collect um, data from them every three years to make it in line with the 73-78 cohort data collection. Right. Um, and a related question from me, which is around what sort of metadata is available about the data that you have? I get calling. Get calling. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, well, we've got quite comprehensive data on the website. So if you go to the data users section, um, we have tables there of the um, cohorts by collections to show when we last updated the data, what coverage it is, how many records there are, and um, also linking to um, other important resources that might help people understand the context of those collections. Does that answer? Yes, Your absolutely. Question? Now stay there, Colleen, oh, don't run oh, away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't run away. The next question is, when releasing data, how do you decide what variables to mask? Is it project specific? Um, no, we, we generally uh, mask, um, like we mask anything that is sensitive so that would include as i said dates of birth um, for any geographic data are always um, coded or collapsed into like a broad category like an aria or a CIFA. same with the geographic um, geo geocoding or um, environmental sorry that's what i was for, environmental data um, those are um, obviously we don't give out geocodes or postcodes or anything like that so um, it's it's all of those sorts of things. Anything that could um, state, we, we just obviously have um, um, the states. We don't uh, generally use any localities um, less than that, unless they've been um, coded first. And um, yeah, that's basically how we control that. But um, we also obviously have the rule, the data aggregation rule, so that when you're publishing or reporting or releasing data, you can't report small cell sizes. So for example, you can imagine that once we start stratifying the sample by state and by ages and by different things, you could get down to some small numbers. So in that case, we might just report um, to, you know, ACT New South Wales together or, you know, things like that so that we don't ever report small cell sizes. Okay, thanks, Colleen. The next question is for Katrina. So if Katrina could come off mute. Yeah, she's <laughs> Thanks. Um, so this question is, I'd like to ask if you were able to use this data to consider outcomes on women, for example, outcomes of first experience of PND, I'm guessing that's postnatal depression, um, higher risks of further postnatal depression with each subsequent pregnancy and outcomes to mental illness. So with the... I think probably the short answer is yes, but not as part of the mothers and their children's health study, because that's all focused on the children's outcomes. But we have used our data to look at maternal outcomes related to postnatal depression. And I think, Gita, would you say that's probably Nicole Riley's papers that focus most on that? Yeah. So Nicole Riley, who's one of the researchers uh, based in New South Wales that works on the longitudinal study, that has been a major focus area for her. So all her papers are listed on our website. So if you jump on the website and do a keyword search for Nicole Riley, you'll be able to find them. And if you have any trouble, just email me. I'm happy to connect you. And we also did a really interesting paper. I think it was last year or the year before looking at whether women were screened according to guidelines for depression. And you might want to check that one out too. Uh, so that that's under my name as the first author, and that was published in Australian New Zealand Journal of Public Health. But that looks at screening rates over time and how it relates to policy. But 
if you have any trouble finding it, just give me an email. Thanks, Katrina. Uh, now the next one, it's probably Gita or Colleen, yeah. um, which is about um, the, linked, the linkage to the Australian Cancer Database and whether that's for the women or for their children. For the women. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. And then the next one is also a sort of more administrative one, which is about um, can other researchers obtain quotes when they're writing grants, for example, can they? And what would the process for obtaining a quote from you to access the data? That, might be that, is, that is challenging. I mean, it's, a, it's an important question. And I think there is, you'll have to go through the EOI process, you have to write exactly what's your research question, why are you using the data, but you can apply. Um, and what happens is that, uh, because when women are putting their comments down, one of the major tasks is to make, because they name themselves or their children and all that. So someone manually has to go through and make sure that it's not, you know, there's no identifiable information. So to answer your question, short question, yes, you can apply for, for it through the usual um, channel. But it's not, there's no cost. There's no cost, cost. yes. Yeah, there's no cost, yeah. None of our, yeah, none of what we do, uh, which it, it's a national resource, so there's so no the cost. Only thing is, sorry to Annette, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Come closer, Annette. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the only issue is if they're using the link data, then you need to use it either here or in Newcastle or Shaw. So that's where the cost comes in the Shaw license. This person but, wants, know, it, yeah. it's, this is a progressive thing, as you yeah. know, and hopefully more and more of these secure um, setups are going to be available. I, this person wants to know about qualitative data. Oh, are you talking about quotes means court, quote, as in costing, yes. Costing. So if they wanted ah, access to the data. I misunderstood, sorry. sorry. I thought it was the qualitative data and you wanted to use the court. Sorry. Quote. Sorry. That's <laughs> pretty good. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, no. So no cost. No, no cost. cost. That no was cost. Except, uh, except what Annette was saying. It has to be done on site or through shore. So through shore, it will cost money to the research. Yes. And we have to find that out. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, next question, I think, uh, I think this is probably you, Geeta, as well. Is Could you tell us more about the um, Southeast Asian cohort that you're proposing? Yeah, that is a good question. We, um, what we're going to do is we have two, the two youngest cohort, the 89, 95 and the 90, 73, 78. Uh, there's been a lot of migration in the last 20 years. And so what we found is that what we can talk about, it's generally representative, but not entirely. And we want to make it as representative as possible. So this year we are going to start, uh, we'll be recruiting um, women from Southeast Asia and South Asia background. The plan is that uh, the questionnaire, they'll will give them, there'll be some additional questions that they will get to sort of catch them, catch up, you know, with the, ori with the main cohorts. But, um, and, but we will be giving them identical where possible question that we'll be giving to the general, uh, the main cohort, so that we can integrate their results back into the, you know, the 1973 cohort. And so can you tell us a bit more about your approach to recruiting? Yeah. Um, mm. Which sort of lends itself to community involvement in the cohort as well. How do you um, work with your participants? We've just started the process. We've just put in, we haven't even piloted out uh, because the funding just starts this year uh, and with COVID and all that, there's been a bit of a delay. But I know Rashika, the first thing we're doing is to get a list of all the community organizations and who to contact. Uh, and we'll be doing this in the next few weeks, actually, we're starting to, so that will be the first thing to do. We need to pilot um, the questionnaire. We need to be talking to the women. Um, so it's all very, it's beginning. Beginning. Okay. You want to add anything? Well, right? Just that Katrina's actually the person who's been yeah. planning the focus groups. Yeah. Not. <laughs> Katrina. Does Katrina want to add anything? 
Yeah. Yeah. So we're, um, we're taking a really consultative approach to recruiting people into the cohort. So as Gita said, we've identified key organisations around the country that work with the women that we're interested in talking to. And we're going to be running a series of focus groups with um, women that we recruit through these community organisations just to talk about what's the best way to encourage women into the study. Um, and so we've got a strategy or a process to follow, but we don't have the content yet because it's going to be informed by what the people in the focus group tell us is the best way to go about it. So it's pretty exciting, really. Yeah, it sounds great. And the next question is um, related. So perhaps you might want to stay on, Katrina. Um, can you please provide an overview if culturally diverse groups are also considered in the study and their outcomes? So in other ways, do you, how do you? Yeah, Gita might be the best one. Yeah, so yep. I think one of the gaps we identified was that we don't have enough of culturally and linguistic diverse group. That's why we're doing this refresh, refreshing of the cohort. Um, I think that for the 1973-78 cohort, I think about 25% were born overseas, but the numbers are not large enough for us to analyze anything. So, yeah, it, these are something that we're very mindful of and trying our best to see what we can do to refresh it. Yeah, and another question is sort of also related as well as will you be, I presume it's providing the surveys and things in language as well as English, so. No. <laughs> no. We did that many, many years ago at the beginning of the study, um, Annette, and there was like a lot of, yeah. <laughs> so we just, it's all, and in fact with the young, the 89, 95 is all entirely through, um, you know, web based. Yes. And the next question is, are you using techniques like natural language processing or machine learning with the qualitative and unstructured data that you collect? No. <laughs> no. Would you like it, to? Well, it, the thing is that for people who have used that sort of data, they have used standard qualitative methods. Uh, it's keyword search or thematic analysis. So, you know, perhaps those who are doing qualitative research might consider that, but definitely, yeah. We haven't got not there not, yet. No, not yet. Okay. <laughs> um, and one more question, I think we'll do. Um, what advice would you provide to anyone who has a large data set and is considering opening it up for more general use? e.g. the potential for overlapping research questions by different groups and the infrastructure required and the ongoing monitoring? I think this is actually a really good question. I'm going to point that to Annette okay. <laughs> and then we can join. All right. <laughs> uh, at the beginning, we thought this was terribly important and particularly uh, protecting a research area for uh, PhD students. Do you so, want to come just a little bit closer to the microphone, Annette? Thanks. So in the beginning, we thought this was really important, particularly for students, uh, and we put a lot of effort into it. Um, gradually over time and talking with other big studies like 45 and up, uh, we decided that was, we were probably wasting our own resources. So now we don't do that sort of overlap checking, but we do provide lay summaries of, of the work that people who've got um, access to the data now uh, gave so that people can check their own stuff. The feeling generally is that different people are likely to approach a question in different ways. But, but, but I mean, the short answer is over time, we've changed from extensive checking to almost none. Thank you. And I think we'll have one more question and then we'll wrap up. Um, and the question is, how is the best way to determine if data of interest is available? For example, the number and type of cases of cancer in a particular cohort. Okay, so the best from survey data, I, I mean, cancers, I don't think we have any, we won't be able to know, but survey data, if anybody wants to know, the distribution frequencies. The best thing to do is go on the website. We have data books 
for all the different surveys so they can look up at the questions and then the distribution and it's all done in Excel so you can plot it, you can compare the same questions in previous years as well, just aggregate data. So that is sort of data cube is available on the website. Thank you. So I think we'll wrap up there. So first of all, thank you to all of our speakers today and uh, the Australian Longitudinal Study of Women's Health for all the effort you, you've put into this presentation. It's been absolutely fantastic. And I think we've all learnt a lot. Just to let everybody know that the video of this presentation will be available shortly and you'll all receive an email letting you know um, how to access that if you want to go back and look at that. And I'm sure also that the, the team at the Longitudinal Study will also be very happy to hear from you and answer any further questions that you might have. So thank you to Geeta, Colleen, Katrina, Louise and Annette. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Oh, and I should, I've got to do one more thing, otherwise I'll get in trouble, is to share the next, wait, forgot about this. I've got to share the next of our webinar series <laughs> will be Professor John Lynch who will be talking on the 28th of April and if you're on our mailing list you'll get more details about that. So thank you all very much and thank you everybody who attended today that was fantastic. Thank you, thanks.